Okay, so we spent some time, large part of the last class, talking about inductive reasoning. Remember, inductive reasoning is pattern-based. You look at a pattern, and you try to make a conjecture. You make your best guess about what you think the next item in the pattern would be. That is inductive reasoning. Remember how that's different from deductive. Deductive, remember, we said it was the process, we're using logic, we're using facts. We're not looking at a pattern, we're basing our conjecture based on fact. All right. Now there's two types of deductive reasoning that we're going to talk about. One of them is called the law of detachment. Got a definition. So if P implies Q, so if P then Q is a true statement, and I know that P is true, then I can say that Q is true. Okay, so what does that mean? Okay, so here it is. So here's my if P then Q. If you have three tardies, then you go to detention. So hypothesis, you have three tardies. Conclusion, you go to detention. Then I'm told that P is true. I'm told Charlie has three tardies. So what can I conclude? I can conclude that Charlie goes to detention. If P implies Q is a true statement, and I know P is true, that Charlie has three tardies, then I know Q is true, which means he must go to detention. Okay, that's detachment. Here's the law of syllogism. I like that word. All right. So, if P implies Q, so if every time we see P, we know that Q is true. And every time we see Q, we know R is true. So, if P then Q, and if Q then R, if both of those are true statements, then I can just say P implies R. P implies R must be a true statement. So if P means Q is true, and Q means R is true, then every time I see P, I must know that R is true. Okay, example. If the measure of angle A is less than 90 degrees, then angle A is an acute angle. Okay, so if P, then Q. Now, if angle A is an acute angle, then angle A is not a right angle. So this one is my if P, then Q. Notice this Q matches this Q. It's the same. Angle A is an acute angle. Angle A is an acute angle. But now here, angle A is an acute angle was my conclusion. Now it's my hypothesis. So if angle A is an acute angle, then angle A is not a right angle. What can I conclude? Well, I can just go straight from if the measure of angle A is less than 90 to then angle A is not a right angle. And that's what I got. So if the measure of angle A is less than 90, then angle A, that's an L. And that's not an L, that's an angle symbol. Then angle A is not a right angle. Okay, so now we're, we're going to try some. Given, so here's my if A then B, I mean if P then Q. If two segments are congruent, then they have the same length. Okay, so that's what I'm given. Then I'm also told that angle B is con uh, angle segment AB is congruent to segment XY. Does this does this match my hypothesis? One segment being congruent to another. Yes, it does. If two segments are congruent, and I'm told I have congruent segments, then what else must be true? Then they have the same length. So I can determine. I can conclude by the law of detachment that AB equals XY. The distance from A to B equals the distance from X to Y. Notice what's different about this one. Given if a number is divisible by 4, so there's my if P, then Q, then it is divisible by 2. And then it says if a number is even, then it is divisible by 2. So I have hypothesis, conclusion, what is this piece? Does this match the conclusion of my first conditional? These two don't match. Remember a while ago when I pointed that out? This was my conclusion of my first statement, and then it became my hypothesis of my second statement. That's not what I have here. So think if we can conclude anything, we'll talk about this one in class. Okay, by conditionals. It's a fancy word. I think you'll, you'll, you'll see pretty easily what it means. So first it says, write the converse for each of the conditionals. Remember, 
Con converse, we just flip the order. We exchange the hypothesis and the conclusion. So if an angle is a right angle, then it measures 90 degrees. First of all, is this true? If an angle is a right angle, then it measures 90 degrees. I'm going to put a T. Yes, that's true. Okay, now I'm going to flip these. Remember, converse means you flip them. So I'm going to write, if an angle measures 90 degrees, then it is a right angle. Okay, is that true? If an angle measures 90 degrees, then it's a right Yep, that's also true. Okay, let's try another one. Okay, if point E bisects segment AB, then E is the midpoint of segment AB. Hopefully we're seeing that that's true. Okay. Converse, we're going to flip it. So if point E is the midpoint of AB, then point E bisects segment AB. Again, that's also true. So, by conditional. When you can combine a conditional statement and its converse, you create a biconditional statement. So when you combine them, when you combine the conditional and the converse into one statement, that's what's called a biconditional. So biconditional, a statement that can be written in the form P if and only if Q. And what that means is like we saw a while ago is that I can go back and forth. My conditional is true. If my conditional is true, then my converse is going to be true. That I'm saying the same thing no matter which way that I go. Remember in class, that's not always true about a converse. Just because the conditional is true, when I do the converse, when I flip it, it does not mean the converse is true. When I have a biconditional, that is what it means. That the conditional and the converse are saying the same thing. So when I write if and only if from now on, that's kind of a lot to write. If and only, I'm just going to put IFF. So this says P if and only if Q. So example, it says rewrite each of the above conditionals as biconditional statements. So I'm going to write an angle is a right angle if IFF, that means if and only if, it measures 90 degrees. So this, this one works both ways. If it measures 90 degrees, then it's a right angle. If it's a right angle, it measures 90 degrees. So if it's an if and only if statement, it works both ways. Think about how we could write the second one as a, as a biconditional. Again, try to get ahead of me to see if you can do it on your own. This is what I got. Point E bisects segment AB if and only if point E is the midpoint of AB. So again, point E bisects AB means E is the midpoint of AB. E is the midpoint of AB means point E bisects AB. So they say the same thing. Write the conditional statement and converse with each biconditional. So now they gave us the biconditional, and we've got to break it down into a conditional and a converse. So here's my conditional. If Cho is a member, then he has paid the dues. You think about what the converse could look like. Think about what the converse would look like. Okay. If he, I, I'm just going to flip the order. If he has paid the dues then Cho is a member. Okay, what about this one? Two angles are congruent if and only if their measures are equal. How could I write a conditional using that sentence? If two angles are congruent, wait, wait no, I'm oh, sorry, I'm breaking it down, yeah, yeah. How can I write a conditional and then a, a converse off of that biconditional? So if two angles are congruent, then their measures are equal. Just go the other way now. Flip it. Use the converse. If two angles have equal measures, then they are congruent. One more page. So let's determine if each biconditional is true. So number three. An odd number is one more than a multiple of two. Okay, think about if that is true. Think about that as true. We'll talk about that one in class. Give that one some thought. So again, to prove that it's not true, can you find an odd number that is not one more than a multiple of two? You don't got to write this down, but that's what you should be thinking about. To show that that's not true, you would need to be able to find one of these. Okay, this one. This one says that y equals negative 5 
means y squared equals 25. So if I go from left to right, doesn't that make sense? That if y equals negative 5, that implies or that means y squared is 25. Okay, so I like that. That makes sense to me. But does it go the other way? Because I should be able to go the other direction too. If y squared equals 25, does that mean that y equals negative 5? Well, couldn't y also, that's false, because couldn't y also be equal to positive 5? Anyway, so this, this is an if and only if symbol. It means this one, I should, it should make sense from left to right, and it should also make sense from right to left. Definition, we're going to skip the definition part. But what we got to be able to do is write a definition as a biconditional. So collinear points are points that lie on the same line. So how can I write this as an if and only if statement? Again, you'll get more out of this if you're trying to do it on your own first and then seeing if you get what I got. So I got to be able to write this as an if and only if statement. How can I do that? Well, here's what I got. Points are collinear. IFF, again, if and only if, they lie on the same line. So again, points are collinear means they lie on the same line. They lie on the same line means points are collinear. You're saying the same thing. You must, it, it must go both ways if it's going to be a biconditional. Okay, the last one. This last one? Yeah, last one. A triangle is a polygon with three sides. Okay, how can I write this as a biconditional? A polygon is a triangle if and only if it has three sides. So again, a, a polygon is a triangle if it has three sides. If it has three sides, then that polygon is a triangle. Biconditionals have to make sense and go both directions. Don't forget there's a quiz in class on conditionals, converse, inverse, and contrapositive.